Good morning, everyone. I guess afternoon. <laughs> uh, we're thrilled to welcome you to our last early career immunology seminar series for the year. Um, just as a heads up, we're really looking for uh, new committee members um, to uh, join the team and uh, overtake uh, putting together all the seminars. Um, e email us or tweet us, uh, PMS, uh, if you're interested. Uh, it is my great pleasure to really welcome Brian Bryson, who's going to be our last seminar speaker for the year. Um, Brian is, uh, I, I guess, been in uh, the Boston area for all of his training and <laughs> apparently liked it enough to stay. Um, so he went to MIT uh, for undergrad and received a Bachelor's of Science. Um, he then uh, stayed there for um, his PhD training with Forrest White, uh, and his thesis was titled Quantitative Approaches to Probe uh, the Acetyl Proteome. Um, he actually moved institutions just a little bit <laughs> for his postdoctoral uh, training with Sarah Fortune, uh, where he studied the host pathogen interactions in TB with single cell resolution, uh, and that he's certainly kept that uh, in his lab uh, at MIT. He's currently, since July of um, this past year, is an associate professor at MIT. Uh, and he's gonna share uh, work with us um, today. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, on uh, his work on a TB. Thanks so much, Brian. Awesome. Thank you, Liza. And thank you all for the introduction and the invitation to speak. I'm really excited to share with you um, what has been a long work in progress and will continue to be a long work in progress for many, many years. But um, I will say at the outset, I'm recruiting postdocs and graduate students. If anybody's looking, um, I'm infinitely looking for postdocs, it feels. Um, in any case, what I'm really excited to share with you is some of the work that we've been doing in our lab. Um, and I just want to remind you that the problem that we work on is a problem of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a is a pandemic every year. Um, it, when I talk about numbers and when I talk about human impact, I want to just emphasize for you that the estimates suggest that nearly a quarter to a third of the global population has been infected with the causative agent mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, this is a real human health um, burden because uh, at least 4,000 people die a day from TB disease. This uh, the progress that has been made in TB treatment and uh, finding the people who are most impacted has been reversed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So the 20 years of progress in TB has been rever is reversed in the last three years. Now, one of the things that's really remarkable about TB everywhere you look is the heterogeneity at every scale. So when we talk about human populations, we can estimate that one in 10 individuals is uh, develops active TB disease, which is characterized by coughing up blood, weight loss, and fatigue. Now, not all hope is lost because we do have a six to nine month four antibiotic regimen. But I just wanna emphasize for you all that when we think about antibiotic distribution, we also need to think about the places where people need antibiotics the most. Um, six to nine months of a four month, four drug regimen is something that is tenable. Um, though what would be transformative would be a licensed protective vaccine. And that's something that we don't presently have in the case of TB. Now, um, I'll talk to you a little bit today about our efforts to think about how we can think about designing next generation TB vaccines. But obviously, um, we've been talking about TB, been calling it TB for over 100 years now, and uh, we lack a licensed protective vaccine. And so what is in the world, why would I continue to work on this area, given the, um, the immense amount of effort that's been made to really try to achieve immunologic success through vaccination. And what I'll highlight for you here first is that I truly believe that immune success is possible. So in the non-human primate model of tuberculosis infection, pioneered by Joanne Flynn and others, what they've demonstrated is that if you take a bronch, if you perform a bronchoscopic installation of MTB in the lungs and then monitor disease dynamics over the course of, you know, six six months or more, what you can find is that um, using PET-CT imaging, you can detect individual granulomas. So these granulomas are the hallmark of TB disease, thought to be one of the major sites of bacterial replication. 
And at the time of necropsy, you can take these granulomas and ask how many of these granulomas contain active uh, cultural bacteria versus those that appear to be completely sterile. And what I wanna highlight for you here is that immune success is possible. So independent of whether that animal is designated as having active disease or a latent disease, um, you can find fully sterile lesions. Now, this is important because this is, says in the absence of antibiotic therapy, the immune system alone can control bacterial infection. So this is what gives me hope, and this is what really keeps us going in our research group. And I'll tell you a little story today about how we think about um, how we can address some of these ongoing immunological uh, unknowns in terms of making a vaccine that can elicit some of the same immunologic parameters that we think is, are active here. So I think it goes without saying that uh, we think a lot about cell-mediated immunity in the context of TB infections. So a TB-infected phagocyte can present antigens on both MHC class one and two. Um, a lot of this work has been done in both murine and non-human primate studies. So I just wanna give you a small snippet of why we think both CD4s and CD8 T cells can contribute to protection. So in uh, the murine model, if you knock out beta 2M and you perform a high dose aerosol challenge in the mouse, what you see is mice lacking beta 2M quickly succumb to infection. Alternatively, as a different experiment, if you deplete CD8 T cells with a uh, anti-CD8 depletion, you find that uh, you find elevated levels of bacterial burden in the lung, liver, and spleen. In the non-human primate model of infection, if you take a previously vaccinated uh, animal and you deplete CD8 T cells in the bronchoalveolar lavage, what you can find is that upon CD8 depletion, these animals look like naive animals in terms of bacterial burden in the lavage. Again, suggesting that CD8 T cells play a role in reducing bacterial burden. Now, it's not all about just about CD8 T cells. I always think about it as an immune system. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the contribution of CD4 T cells as well. So again, we can see similar results in, um, in the mouse where we deplete CD4 T cells and we see an increase in bacterial burden in the lung and spleen. Similarly, if you deplete T cells, CD4 T cells in the non-human primate, you find an increase in bacterial burden upon CD4 uh, depletion. Okay, so what these experiments suggest is that T cells play a causal role in kind of controlling bacterial burden. Now, what they don't necessarily address is um, how do we think about now taking these kind of immunologic observations and think about translating them into uh, platforms that we can use in a vaccine pr paradigm. And when we really thought about, okay, how can we contribute to this body of literature, this body of knowledge around cell-mediated immunity in the context of TB? What we really thought about is addressing uh, a really important question. And that important question are, what are the antigens presented by MTB-infected human phagocytes? Now here, as I'll tell you a little bit more about TB, TB is antigenically complex. It expresses near at least 4,000 different proteins. Um, we don't really fully understand the dynamics of where all these proteins are localized, um, even in exenic culture, much less in um, an infected phagocyte setting. So when you think about how can we begin to understand and navigate this complex, um, pot potentially complex antigenic repertoire and really identify what are the TB proteins that ultimately get presented on either MHC class one or two, what we, what we confronted was this major unknown. And so the way that we sought to address this major unknown was to perform a simple experiment. And that simple experiment was to define the immunopeptidome of uh, MTB infected cells. And when I tell you about this experiment, what I wanna emphasize for you here is that our lab really likes to center our analyses in human cells. Why is that important to us? By centering our analyses in human cells, we can really incorporate all of the nuances of human cell biology, especially human phagocyte biology namely the expression of MH, appropriate MHC alleles, um, antigen processing machinery, uh, human versus murine differences in phagosomal biochemistry. So by performing all of these experiments in human cells, we could really try to take away one kind of gap in our translation translational path is to really understand what are human cells capable of presenting. Now, the way that we do this experiment is we use human CD14 monocyte drive macrophages. We infect them with virulent H37RV. When we started these experiments, we really didn't know if we were gonna see anything. Um, remind, remember that TB glows 
grows very slowly. It doubles about every 24 hours. So what we really wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to see was anything, if there was anything to be detected. So we went for 72 hours. It's kind of this happy medium between work-life balance, pathogen replication, and macrophage death. So that was really the selection of the 72 hour time point. And then our hypothesis was, is that we would be able to detect MTB derived peptides presented on MHC class one. And so in order to test that hypothesis, we performed a class one Im uh, immunoprecipitation using the W632 antibody. Then we don't really care specifically about the class one protein itself. We really care about the peptides that, that are bound. And so in order to isolate the peptides from the a bound protein, we can either perform a molecular weight cutoff filter to separate the peptides from the proteins and then perform liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, which is just going to tell us what is the full peptidome of being what's being presented. Or as an alternative biochemical strategy, what we can use is what's called solid phase extraction, which allows us to perform fractionation by reverse phase liquid chromatography. Obviously, one of the benefits of fractionation is it allows us to dig deeper. That was our hypothesis going in. And then similarly, we're going to use the mass spectrometer to detect and identify the sequence of the peptides that we find that are bound. Okay, so this is the basic experimental platform that I'm just going to just that I'm going to be using throughout this talk. Okay, so the first question is, is what do we see? And so just at a high level, um, on the y-axis here, I'm plotting the number of unique peptide IDs. You can see in this first protocol, which was just our molecular weight cutoff filter, we're seeing about 5,000 or so peptides, not a huge difference between cells that underwent an infection with TB or a mock infection where we just changed the medium. What you can also see here is that when we move to our second new protocol, this uh, fractionation protocol, on average, we were able to boost the total number of peptides that we identified. Um, one thing that I'll highlight for you here is that we did try a few experimental perturbations, adding interferon gamma to see if that would change the overall repertoire of what we identified, adding cyclohexamide to disrupt host protein translation to try to boost the number of TBIDs. Um, but what you can see at the wholesale level is just the total peptide IDs didn't really change much with those perturbations that we introduced. Now, this is all peptides. The question is, is how many of these are derived from MTB and what are they, if any? Okay, and so I just want to remind you that on this X, in this y-axis, we're looking at the a scale of thousands. So now let's talk about TB-derived peptides. When we talk about TB-derived peptides, our y-axis is going to eight. Um, our record is seven uh, different MTB-derived peptides. Our low is one. So what I want to highlight for you here is that the TB derived, um, the TB contribution to the class one immunopeptidome is very small. Our estimates is that it's less than 0.1% of the total immunopeptidome that we can detect. Okay, so the dirty laundry of immunopeptidomics is that unlike, say, for example, other proteomic techniques that you may have utilized where you use a triptych digest, which forces there to be either a lysine or an arginine at the C-terminus, immunopeptidomics is a little bit different because you're just asking what peptide is bound to the class one molecule. Now, there are some parameters that you can put constraints around, for example, length, size, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera, but there's not necessarily amino acid rules that constrain the search that these mass spec search algorithms perform. And what I really want to emphasize for you here is that if you just trust the mass spectrometry search algorithms, you get an overall uh, high number of false positives. Um, so we really needed an alternative strategy to really be able to quantitatively verify that the peptides that we say are derived from MTB and being presented are truly there. So the way that we do this is we use stable isotope labeled standards. And so let's hypothesize that this biological peptide is what the mass spectrometer is telling us that we saw. What we can do is we can make a synthetic stable isotope labeled peptide, which is the exact same amino acid sequence, but at one of these amino acids, we incorporate heavy labeled, a heavy labeled amino acid. And what's important about that is that now we have this kind of synthetic stable isotope labeled standard that we can then spike in to our class one peptide mixture. And what's valuable about this is because of this um, incorporation of this heavy labeled amino acid, what we can see when we do a, uh, an MS1 scan is we'll see a mass offset between the endogenous biological peptide and the synthetic stable isotope labeled peptide. This is so 
but everything else should effectively be the same, namely the hydrophobicity and the fragmentation spectra. So what we can then ask is, do our fragmentation spectra map match when we fragment the biological peptide versus the synthetic peptide? And then similarly, because the hydrophobicity of these peptides should be effectively identical, we should look for coelution of these peptides. So they should be coeluting into the mass spectrometer at the same time. And so let me just show you what that data look, what those data look like in practice. Um, if we actually take this um, peptide derived from ESXA, we can spike in our heavy labeled synthetic isotope labeled standard peptide, and we can look at the samples that underwent an MTB infection or a mock infection. And what I want to draw your attention to here is that um, in both the mock infection and the TB infection, we find the heavy labeled isotope labeled standard peptide that we spiked in. But now only in the setting of the MTB sample do we see the light biological endogenous peptide. Again, say, suggesting to us that, okay, yes, this peptide really can only be detected in the setting of MTB infection. Now that's step one, we see coelution. The second thing that we want to make sure is that the fragmentation spectra of these peptides match. And so what I'm showing you here on the top of this uh, MSMS spectra is the biological peptide. On the bottom is the synthetic peptide. And what I wanna draw your attention to is the fragmentation spectra are effectively identical, save for a small offset due to the introduction of the heavy labeled amino acid. So for all the for every peptide that we've identified, we've done the exact same exercise where we synthesize a heavy labeled amino acid, uh, heavy labeled amino acid containing peptide. We spike that in and we validate every peptide. Now, what does that mean in practice? Um, one might ask, does this actually impact uh, the number of IDs that you generate? And yes, it does. Actually, in fact, over 50% of the peptides that we um, were predicted by the mass spec algorithm were discarded because they did not pass this biochemistry filter. So this is just a cautionary tale as people begin to continue to use these techniques that you really need to have orthogonal ways to confirm the observation that you're making. Okay, so this is awesome. This is, I, um, this is really exciting for us because it says that yes, we can identify TB peptides. Now, one of the things that I'm gonna argue was a feature, not a bug, uh, was that when we were doing these experiments, we were just randomly purchasing leukopaks. So we were not controlling for genotype, especially when it came to MHC allele. So that means we just had random people uh, donating blood and we were generating macrophages and performing these infections. And so one of the questions that we could then ask is, okay, instead of just thinking about, about um, a protein centric view, just looking at the diversity of human responses, tell us a kind of a, a slightly more expansive story about what are the TB proteins that are generating antigens that are capable of being presented on MHC class one. So here I'm just showing you a summary of the data for class one thus far. So here we're looking at the source MTB proteins, the peptide sequence, the class one allele that we identified with help from Mary Carrington and Yuko Yuki, and the donors from which these peptides were generated. And I want to just hum summarize a few really important observations. The first ob observation is that we do identify certain proteins that generate multiple different peptides that are presented on multiple different MHC alleles. At the same time, we've not yet found a single protein that generates peptides that we can detect presented across all MHC alleles. Uh, this, in, the other important thing that I really want to emphasize for you here is that all these protein, peptides that have an asterisk are known to be immunogenic in people. One of the big questions that you can ask is when you're doing an in vitro experiment, what is the possibility that you're actually recovering things that are known that are potentially immunogenic in people? And these are just a subset of the antigens that have been tested in people for peptide-specific responses. Now, if we take it one step further, we can ask, okay, what is the nature of the class of the proteins that we're seeing presented? And one of the things that I wanna highlight for you here is that in this color coding, we can see that we see a lot of red proteins. What are these red proteins? These red proteins are substrates of the type seven secretion system from MTB. And you could ask yourself, is this what we would expect to observe by chance? And the way that we can perform that analysis is that we can actually quantify the distribution of type seven secretion substrates across the MTB proteum. And what I wanna highlight for you here is that the, type, the contribution of type seven secretion system proteins to the overall MTB proteum is quite small. Now, by contrast, if we look at the immunopeptidome, we saw this really strong enrichment of type seven secretion system substrates 
being presented on MHC class one in the context of TB infection. Okay, so um, just a little bit about the type seven secretion system. In MTB, there are five ESX one through five, um, and we were able to identify substrates secreted by three of these systems, ESX one, three, and five. And really when we think about the interaction between TB and the host immune system, there are two proteins that have been deeply, deeply characterized for their ability to really influence host uh, and phagocyte physiology specifically. And those two proteins are ESX A and B. ESX A and B are um, secreted as a heterodimer via ESX1 and work from Robbie Watson in Jeff Cox's lab when he was a graduate student demonstrated that the ESX um, a, that the ESXA or ESAT6 protein contributes to uh, phagosomal membrane damage. And so here on this top panel, I'm showing you MTB here in red, co-localizing with P62, an autophagy adapter, as well as uh, co-localizing with ubiquitin. And when you infect with an ESAT6 deletion mutant, what you observe is that this co-localization is lost. Okay, so now we can do this, go from this kind of discovery uh, mass spec through immunopeptidomics and begin to think, okay, now how do we take it one step further and go from discovery to hypothesis? And so the next questions we really want to ask is, can we be mechanistically begin to dissect the, uh, the bacterial and host features that contribute to presentation of these MTB antigens on MHC class one. And so what we have thus far with our experiments is this observation that we infect, and we see these peptides presented on MHC class one in the context of infection. But really at a cellular level, we can hypothesize a few different mechanisms by which this may be occurring. One model is whereby TB is inside of a phagosome, you have fusion with either late endosomes or lysosomes containing cathepsins, you get this phagolysosome, you get generation of peptides through proteolytic activity in this phagolysosome, and then you have MHC class one being directly loaded at the MTB containing phagolysosome, and then presentation on the surface. So to test if that hypothesis or mechanism were true in our system, what we did is suggest an initial experiment where we looked for class one co-localization with MTB at a variety of time points, as early as four hours and as late as five days. And what I really want to highlight for you is that at none of the time points that we analyzed did we see really robust co-localization between MTB and MHC class one. Okay, so what are alternative mechanisms by which we can hypothesize? Um, and this is really why I emphasize for you that uh, this ESXAB heterodimer can contribute to phagosomal membrane damage, is you could alternatively hypothesize that the phagosome to cytosol model is a potentially a model by which MTB antigens are gaining access to antigen processing machinery. And so the hypothesis here is that the phagosomal membrane is being damaged, uh, MTB derived proteins are gaining access to the cytosol, where they can be processed by the proteasome, delivered into the ER via TAP, and then su subsequently pro uh, presented um, on MHC class one. Okay, so in order to test that hypothesis, we wanted to confirm because obviously actually a lot of the experiments about membrane damage in the context of TB infection have been done in murine phagocytes. And we wanted to really understand if these principles were also consistent in primary human monocyte derived macrophages. So we infected, with MTB. And again, at the same time points that I highlighted for you here, MTB in green are different markers of uh, now membrane damage, either galactin-3 or P62 as used in the Cox paper. What I hope you can see is that at all these different time points, we see co-localization between these membrane damage markers in MTB. What I'll also highlight for you here is that, again, this is not homogeneous. It's a very heterogeneous co-localization, which could raise some interesting questions about uh, how uh, T-cell recognition of these MTB-infected phagocytes may occur. Okay, so this is, again, descriptive suggesting that, yes, TB uh, drives phagosomal damage in these human monocyte-derived macrophages. How can we think about testing mechanistic hypotheses? And for, for as a first pass, what we did is we said, let's go ahead and take advantage of bacterial genetics as a way to probe some of the dynamics of these systems. And so what we did here is we leveraged a mutant in ESX1 activity, that's this ECCCA1 transposon. Again, it's in green. And compared to wild type MTB, when we look at galactin 3 co-localization now, what we can observe is that when we infect with this um, ESX1 activity mutant, we lose the co-localization with galactin 3. 
providing a really nice mechanistic probe to begin to understand how ESX1 activity and the subsequent downstream responses to ESX1 activity on the host side contribute to presentation on MHC class one. So that's what we wanted to do is in, we wanted to then next mechanis mechanistically dissect the host and bacterial determinants of antigen presentation on MHC class one. Okay, so this is at this point, we said, okay, we can't continue to do these experiments as we have done previously, where we're just randomly using Leukopax because we really wanted to now specifically test particular hypotheses about the presentation of specific peptides. And so this is where we then transition to a genetically controlled system where we bought HLA type leukopax um, with particular MHC alleles so that we could track specific MTB derived peptides and their presentation during infection. And so for this experiment, we purchase uh, leukopax that were both HLA A0201 and HLA B5701 double positive. And we pursued that because we'd previously seen peptides derived from ESXA presented on A0201 and ESXJ presented on B57. And our hypothesis here is that if we were able to track these specific peptides as a function of different uh, experimental perturbations, we could now mechanistically understand how, for example, ESX1 activity contributes to the presentation of both the ESXA peptide as well as the ESXJ peptide. Okay, so our kind of conceptual model going in was that in a wild type system, ESX1 act in a wild type MTB infection specifically, um, ESXA can be secreted. ESXA contributes to this phagosomal membrane damage phenotype. By contrast, ESXJ is secreted by ES the ESX5 system. Specifically, what I'll highlight for you here is that in a scenic culture, if you were to knock out ESX1 activity, ESX5 uh, secretes no problem. But by contrast, when we think about ESX1 in the context of a macrophage, we won't need to like think about this one extra layer of, uh, of secretion, and that's the secretion beyond the phagosome. And so if we in, now envision infecting with an ESX1 activity mutant, as we do with this ECC CA1 transposon, what we know is that we'll lose ESX1 secretion activity. So that means we're going to lose ESXA. Now, by contrast, if this kind of phenotype mediated by ESXA, namely phagosomal membrane damage, is important for the presentation of ESXJ, ESXJ will still be secreted into the phagosome, but in the absence of phagosomal membrane damage, ESXJ can't get out. And if we hypothesize that this escape from the phagosome is important for antigen presentation, we'd hypothesize that we'd lose both um, in an ESX1 mutant, we'd lose ESXA, but we'd also lose ESXJ. So that was the hypothesis that we wanted to test. And in order to test that hypothesis, we infected with wild type MTB or this ESX1 mutant and examined antigen presentation on MHC class one. So one of the things that I maybe didn't emphasize for you at the beginning is that when we do all these experiments, we're using about 25 million cells as input for our discovery experiments. But now because we're now thinking, okay, look, we're doing a targeted analysis where we should hopefully be able to achieve more sensitivity because we're just tracking specific peptides, the question was, could we go lower? And the answer is yes. So we use a method called SureQuant, which enables detection of MTB peptides with incredibly low sample input. So here we can now use 10 million cells. We can now do it as low as 1 million cells as total cell input to our experiments. Now, the challenge that now doing all these experimental perturbations introduces is now we're doing separate IPs because we're infecting with wild type MTB, we're infecting with mutants, and we need a way to control for our IP efficiency. And the way that we do that is we use what are called HIP MHCs. These contain UV cleavable peptides. We can do a UV exchange. We can load these peptide MHC we can load these MHC molecules. We can perform an ELISA to quantify the concentration of these HIP MHCs. And then we can actually spike in known quantities of these HIP MHCs into all of our IPs. Where, and now this provides us with a way to control for IP efficiency across multiple different IPs. And then similarly, we can then do our peptide isolation and do a sure quant analysis to quantify and track specific peptides. And so for the experiment I'm going to describe to you, I'll describe to you two controls that we first tested. 
uh, we first looked at class one expression on the surface as a function of wild type MTB infection or ESX1 activity mutant. And what we found is that there is no difference in class one expression on the surface of these macrophages at the time point that we analyzed, as well as no difference in bacterial burden at the time points analyzed. And this is just going to be important when we see the experimental results I'll show you in a second. Okay. So we've got all of our tools. We've gone from discovery to hypothesis testing. So what's the hypothesis that we wanted to test? The hypothesis we wanted to test is that upon loss of ESX1 activity, we would lose the presentation of the ESX A peptide for sure. And if phagosomal membrane damage or ESX1 activity is really a conduit by which uh, other non-ESX1 substrates gain access to antigen processing machinery, our hypothesis was that we should also lose the presentation of those peptides. Again, we use SureQuant in order to be able to do this initially. And what I'm showing you here is just what, we, what we've seen previously before. Here is a mock infection. We don't detect the MTB-derived peptides at all. Here we infect with wild type H37RV. And what I just want to note for you here is that methionines are easily oxidized. So we track both an oxidized form of this ESXJ peptide as well as a non-oxidized form. And here's, so that's what we see three different peptides. And so here's what we look, see when we see wild type MTB infection. And now we're going to infect with our ESX1 activity mutant. And really to our surprise, this is the cleanest biological results I've ever had in my life. Um, a, we lost the presentation of all three of these peptides consistent with our hypothesis. Now, the thing about ESX1 activity is that it's one highly well studied in the context of TB infection and is known to do a lot of things like ESX1 activity in a macrophage is doing the most. Um, one of the things that ESX1 activity is known to drive is a type one interferon response following infection. And so when we think about losing ESX1 activity, we're actually losing a lot in addition to losing the membrane damage phenotype. So we wanted to think about ways in which we could start to complement in components of the host's ESX1 response and understand whether the observations that we're making could be attributed to various components of the ESX1 response. The easiest one for us to test initially was the loss of interferon induction. So we said, let's go ahead and take the ESX1 activity mutant and then uh, treat with inter type 1 interferons. And what we can see here is that uh, add back of exogenous type 1 interferons had absolutely no impact on the presentation of these peptides. Okay, so our model thus far is that um, the presentation of these antigens are rely on ESX1 activity and in type 1 interferon independent manner. Um, but then, you know, one question you might ask is, okay, are there, is there an alternative way to show the to demonstrate what you observe. And as I mentioned to you before, many of these peptides that we identified in our TB experiments are in vitro are known to be immunogenic in people. And this is when I tell you serendipity sometimes happens. And fortunately, a group at OHSU, the Lewinson lab, had actually already identified a T cell clone that, uh, um, that recognizes specifically the ESXJ peptide that we'd identified by immunopeptidomics. And they were so generous to share the T-cell clone with us. And what that really provided was an, uh, an, altern an additional way to begin to probe aspects of um, CD8 T-cell recognition of TB-infected phagocytes. One of the things that I want to highlight for you here is that the field has kind of not necessarily appreciated um, the potential contribution of CD8 T-cells one, because of a major observation that's been made in the C57 Black 6 mouse. And that observation here is that if you take the immunodominant uh, T cell response that you observe in a C57 Black 6 mouse, you take those T cells and you cold culture them with TB infected macrophages. One observation is that the TB infected macrophages do not well act, do not activate those CD8 T cell clones very well. And so this has led the field to not necessarily appreciate a potential contribution for CD8 T cells in the context of infection, in part because of the major immunodominant response that you observe in the C57 black 6 mouse tells you that those T cells can't necessarily uh, recognize and become activated by the TB infected phagocyte. But I, what I draw your attention to here is that they can be activated to produce interferon gamma when you peptide load the cells. So we wanted to just basically repeat this direct experiment a, a, now armed with our T-cell clones that we obtained from the Lewinson lab. And so now I'm just going to show you a little bit of flow cytometry data. This is a T-cell co-culture 
where we either co-cultured the uh, T cell clones with either mock infected cells or TB infected cells, plus or minus peptide, plus or minus the ESX1, acti uh, ESX1 activity. What we're looking at first is just a mock infection. And this is just to confirm the activity of our T cell clone. So, and then we looked at a number of different T cell markers. Here, what I'm looking at is CD107A as a marker of degranulation and GMCSF cytokine production. Here you can see that in the absence of peptide, the T cells are not really well activated. When we peptide load with the cognate peptide, we see strong degranulation in GMCSF production. And here, if you don't cult culture with macrophages at all, you don't really see any signal in the T cells at all. Now, what happens when we add MTB? So now I'm showing you the addition of H37RV. And again, this is a co-culture experiment. These co-culture time points are um, as early as six hours after co-culture. What I want to draw your attention to here is that now in the absence of peptide, we are seeing the T cells becoming activated because the T cells are, or the macrophages are infected with wild type h 37 rv and presenting the cognate peptide. Now, importantly, if we peptide load on top of that, we can increase and boost the response. And then really the killer experiment for us was that, okay, if this is all true, hopefully we'll be able to recapitulate the one additional aspect of our previous experiments that we've done with mass spectrometry, and that's to show ESX1 activity dependence. And when we infected with an ESX1 activity mutant, we saw that the response in the T cells went back to the levels of the no peptide um, loaded cells. So this is really awesome because one, it suggests that yes, we can use immunopeptidomics to mechanistically determine, and then we have an orthogonal validation set up to really confirm the predictions that our system has made. So we're really confident that, okay, the observations that we're making about antigen presentation and the contribution of ESX1 is really important. Okay, so that's that was really clean, I hope. Um, now, what I'm gonna tell you about is the murky parts. Um, okay, so what are the murky parts of this story? When we start to, to look at host determinants, one of the things that we utilize, again, we're working in primary human monocyte-derived macrophages, we wanted a um, we wanted a way to begin to probe host components, um, and so we first turned to small molecule perturbations. Um, we inhibited the cathepsins using E sixty four D. We inhibited vacuolar acidification using baflomycin, and we inhibited the proteasome using MG one thirty two. And really, what I'll highlight for you here is that when we did these various perturbations, what we found is that inhibition of vacuolar acidification slightly increased the presentation of the TB-derived peptides. But when we use either E64D or MG132, what we found is that acute inhibition of either cathepsins or proteasome activity did not lower the presentation of MTB-derived peptides. Now, what I'll also highlight for you here is the additional control experiments that we did is that when we observed that we weren't seeing an uh, impact on TB-derived peptides with these drug perturbations, we said, okay, um, how else can we confirm? We did all the Western blots and activity assays to confirm that the activity of the cathepsins were being disrupted, that uh, we were seeing accumulation of K48-linked ubiquitin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we saw all those things happening. So then we said, let's go ahead and track, in addition to tracking TB-derived peptides, let's go ahead and track um, self-derived peptides. And what we observed there was quite interesting. What we observed there is that when we inhibited um, proteasome activity or cathepsins, what we found is that that did have an impact on the presentation of self-peptides, where it did not have an impact was on the presentation of TB-derived peptides. And I'm happy to speculate in the Q&A session about what are the potential mechanisms that we're exploring that might be consistent with the model or the data that I'm uh, presenting thus far. Okay, so, um, the, so that was um, all of the work of one graduate student. And then um, uh, nevertheless, they persisted and they said, okay, we also need to be able to address questions about MHC class two. Um, so I'm just going to summarize in one slide, six months of work towards uh, making immunopeptidomics work for MHC class two. Um, and I'll just describe to you what we had to do in order to be able to get there. Um, one was optimize the antibodies that we're using. There are many class two antibodies there on the market. We um, asked which peptides give us uh, better, um, better immunoprecipitations. 
We optimize some of the biochemistry, namely how we perform our peptide isolation, how we uh, do our fractionation of our peptides, as well as how we just operate the mass spectrometer in terms of injection time of the, of the ions. Um, I won't show you any of those data yet because this is a work in progress and I don't wanna um, misleadingly or get people excited about particular antigens that we haven't yet validated. Um, we look forward to sharing those data soon. Um, but I want to take a step back and come back to this question that I set up this talk with, is that how can we use these principles to understand vaccine design? I'm going to share with you some kind of closing thoughts about, I think, what I think are hurdles um, for existing vaccines and what I think are even hurdles for the observations that we've made today. Okay, so what does this all mean for TB vaccine design? So I first want to highlight for you BCG. BCG is the vaccine that is still administered in many parts of the world for TB. Its protective efficacy has not had the impact it needs to reverse the TB pandemic. Now, there are people talking about alternative models for BCG uh, immunization, um, uh, modifying BCG in some ways, but let's just talk about the BCG that we know today and its administration. Um, so one of the things that really was powerful with the advent of whole genome sequencing was the ability to compare BCG, which is an attenuated form of Mycobacterium bovis, to TB, to ask, what are the differences between these two organisms? And might that shed some insight about the very the difference between uh, the protection that BCG might confer for TB? And so what I'll highlight for you is that in that exercise, one observation that was made was the identification of what are called regions of difference. Regions of difference are genomic operons or genomic loci that are present in TB, but absent in BCG, meaning that BCG does not have these proteins. So I wanna highlight for you one example of where I think this plays an important role in thinking about how we think about the observations that we've made thus far in our immunopeptidomics work to vaccine design and development. So here I just highlight for you what is region of difference one. So again, this entire operon is absent in BCG. Now, what I wanna also highlight for you here is that these starred proteins are proteins that we are seeing presented by MTB infected phagocytes. And really the simple interpretation of these data is that BCG lacks these proteins. Now, one other thing that I think is really exciting and interesting to think about, and this is still work in progress for us, is that uh, we know that ESX1 activity is important. If you actually start to delete ESX A and B, they really start to disrupt overall ESX1 function, um, namely through loss of phagosomal damage, but also in just how ESX1 um, activity overall in the bacterium operates. And what we've shown thus far is that ESX1 activity is really important for the presentation of many MTB-derived peptides that are not even ESX1 substrates. So when we think about what RD1 is losing, it's not just the identity of these proteins, it's the function of these proteins and their fun potential function, especially in the context of an MTB-infected phagocyte. Okay, so... Um, there's one last thought I wanna leave you with, is that how are we going to take all these principles and translate them into vaccines? So one of the, one of the, one of the questions we began to ask ourselves that the reviewers asked us was like, where's the rest of it, right? I set this up with thinking about there's 4,000 TB proteins, like, you know, we're seeing, you know, a small number of those proteins being represented. Is this a detection limit thing? Is it that we are um, missing uh, potential additional peptides derived from these same proteins? So we needed a way to try to think about the simple question is, what are we missing? Um, so uh, there's a number of different ways by which we could think about this. Um, we took two different kind of complementary strategies because now, as I mentioned to you before, the localization of many MTB proteins in the context of an infected phagocyte is really a murky area, in part because, one, we don't really have really great monoclonal antibodies to track the localization of these proteins. The secretion of these proteins might be at low stoichiometry. And then also that tagging of these proteins endogenously in the bacterium has not been successful in a way to perform kind of live cell imaging to track where the antigen is being secreted inside of the cell. 
But nevertheless, one of the things that we did have access to is the known positives of here are TB antigens that we know to be presented. So we can look at this two ways. We can look at this literally to say, we know that ESXA is being, pre uh, being peptides from, derived from ESXA are being presented. And therefore, um, we know ESXA, the protein is gaining access to antigen processing machinery. So we can then say, okay, what do some of these algorithms about antigen presentation um, predict about other ESXA-derived peptides that are strong candidates for binding to particular class one alleles? Similarly, we can also use high throughput biochemical strategies such as yeast surface display to begin to identify additional candidate binders beyond the algorithmic predictions to have a biochemical high throughput assay to ask about what are the peptides that can bind and stabilize class one. Now, what both of these assays miss is that they do not really account for the endogenous processing and presentation and competition for class one loading that occurs within the cell. But it at least takes some of these parameters out of context to say like, what are potential additional peptides that could be presented? So we did this exercise both using NetMHC PAM, as well as the surface display in collaboration with my great colleague, Michael Birnbaum, where we took a library of uh, nine MERS derived from the MTB's type seven secretion system because we saw those proteins being enriched, derived from existing vaccine antigens, we used a modified version of their use surface display system to identify uh, peptides derived from MTB that could stabilize class one on the surface of the yeast. And then we can take all these hits and identify additional peptides with either uh, net MHC pan predictions or biochemical evidence for class one binding. And so I'm just gonna show you again, here's ESXA. This LLD peptide on the bottom here is a peptide that we've previously identified as being presented. If we look, for example, here's this other peptide whose p-value in these kind of surface display experiments or net MHC pan would tell you that they're not that different in terms of what the algorithms or the yeast surface display would predict. But what I'm going to show you in a second is the difference in reality when we think about the actual infection. So here again, is this TB peptide that we've spent a lot of time talking about, this LLD peptide. And here, we're again using SureQuant to now quantify and detect the presentation of these peptides. And this is really a unique strength of the mass spec-based strategies, because traditionally, when you're thinking about looking for the presentation of a particular peptide, you need a T-cell clone. You need a T-cell clone in order to be able to do that. Um, by contrast, what we have ac accessible to us now is this SureQuant method, which is just going to ask, is this peptide being presented? And we don't need a T-cell clone in order to do that readout. And so this is really a key strength of this approach. And so now again, we can compare the biological peptide versus, versus the synthetic peptide. And again, we're looking at plus minus MTB infection. Now here, when we look at plus MTB infection, you see this peptide in the plus MTB setting. You don't detect it in the no MTB setting, but in both settings, you detect the synthetic peptide. Now, what happens if we take a peptide that's predicted to be presented by these algorithms or shown to stabilize class one in, an, in a yeast display system? Here we see this peptide that has similar confidence from these algorithms, but we, and we can detect the synthetic peptide, but in no way, shape, or form do we detect this peptide being presented in the context of infection. And this is a really important point that when we take when we we can't necessarily be taking for granted these biochemical or algorithmic possibilities, we really need to be able to be sure, be certain that these um, that these peptides are actually truly being presented in the context of infection. So this is uh, what we see for ESXA. We can do the same exercise for ESXG. Um, here again, you see the synthetic peptide in both settings. Um, and here, when we look in the biological peptide, we see only we, um, we only see the coalition of like the relevant peptides. This is kind of a misleading artifact that I haven't cleaned up yet. Um, a in the setting of the TB derived peptide and TB infection. Similarly here, when we take another high confidence peptide that NetMHC pan would tell you is kind of a similar elution rank, we only see the synthetic and we do not see the endogenous peptide. 
Now, experiments that we can do here to really shore up these observations is yes, we can do these experiments with as low as a million cells, but we've actually even gone up to using 200 million cells in our pull downs to really shore up the observations that we're making here. And really what I wanna highlight for you here is that actually this broader uh, question of like what peptides are we potentially missing? We actually synthesized a synthetic library of 186 MTB derived peptides that had high confidence in either a combination of used surface display or net MHC pan. And we tracked all of them. And really what I'll highlight for you here as a closing thought is that of 186 MTB derived peptides that could stabilize HLA-AO2 and yeast surface display, only two of 186 were detected as presented in MTB infected samples. Actually, those are the two that we'd previously detected in our discovery mass spec algorithms or our discovery mass spec experiments. Um, so maybe I'll close up there. Uh, hopefully what I've shown you today is that we've optimized methods to discover, validate and quantify TB peptides presented on MHC class one and two in human cells. This is really important. TB is a human disease. Um, that TB infected human phagocytes present types of insecretion system substrates on class one. Hopefully I have something to share with you soon about class two and that ESX1 activity um, contributes to presentation of TB antigens on class one, possibly through phagosomal membrane damage. Um, so with that, I will close. Um, one, again, uh, highlighting this open call for postdoc applications, um, but not without thanking the people who did this work. Um, every experiment that I described to you today was done by a really talented fourth year graduate student, Owen Letty. Um, he will be looking for postdoc opportunities soon, um, so maybe we can do a trade. Um, uh, I don't do this work alone. I have an amazing research group that supports all the work. Um, amazing collaborators, Amy Barzak for just general community support, as well as uh, some TB mutants, Mary Carrington for HLA typing along with Yuko Yuki. The Lewinsons for their contribution and sharing of many T cell clones, and uh, Forrest White for really strong collaborations in the mass spectrometry, um, and you for your attention. And so I'm happy to close up there and take any questions that you might have. Thanks so much. That was just fantastic. Um, there are already a number of questions in YouTube and keep those questions coming. Um, so the first question is from Cheryl Fernandez. Hi, Dr. Bryson, could an adjuvant be used to increase uh, TB peptide expression on MHC class one? That's part one. And then part two, do macrophages uh, exposed to heat killed RV present any uh, TB antigens? So, okay, so that's a really good question. So um, I'll answer the second question first. So actually when we were starting to optimize a lot of these experiments, we were using TB lysate um, and there we weren't really seeing much in the way of presentation. We've not done heat killed bacteria yet, um, though that is an experiment that we're really excited about doing. Um, uh, and I guess my hypothesis there is it's really going to depend um, my hypothesis there is that we might see some TB antigens, um, but they may not be the same ones because I'm not sure about ESX1 activity as a function of heat killing. Um, now, your question about adjuvanting. I'm very curious about this. Um, one of the questions that I'm really curious about overall is like, how does the state or the identity of the phagocyte overall impact the presentation of the peptides that we detect? Um, so in work that I didn't describe to you today, we started to try to think about different perturbations we can make to the phagocyte to try to change the overall repertoire. We've not yet found one. Um, it, what I'll say for class two, the thing that appears to make the biggest impact is perturbations that overall increase class two expression on the surface. Um, a, but as far, I had this, I kind of had this like, hypothesis going in that, okay, a gamma activated macrophage or like a DC was gonna present a fundamentally different repertoire. And that's not what we're finding yet. Um, that's not to say that we've been, that we've tested every potential perturbation. We certainly haven't, but yeah, I, if you have suggestions of adjuvants to try, I'm, I'm game to try anything. Um, but thus far it, the system has been a little bit more let's say rigid than I would have expected.
Thank you. Uh, next question is from Xu Zhao. Brian, does TB infection uh, inhibit class one presentation? From, uh, from the peptide loading experiment with uh, TB infection, it looks like infection inhibits T cell activation in the presence of peptide loading. Yeah, so that's a good question. So if we look at overall class one levels on the surface, we don't really see a huge difference. We did a series of experiments where we looked for co-stimulatory molecules and their expression on the surface of TB infected phagocytes. And we could do this a few ways. We can look at mock versus infected. And then we can, be, if we infect with fluorescent bacteria, we can look at the bystanders versus the directly infected cells. And there's not a huge difference there. Um, a, so what I think is really happening in the context of TB is that um, I think that if we hypothesize back to, let me see if I can scroll back to the immunofluorescence imaging of membrane damage. One of the things that I just want to draw your attention to is that ESX1, I sometimes think about these membrane damage phenotypes as a readout for ESX1 activity of the phagocyte in the phagocyte. And one of the things that you can see here is that, look, there's co-localization with galactin-3 here, but not here at all. And so I think one of the mechanisms by which TB is kind of evading uh, or disrupting presentation, at least as class one goes, is just not have ESX1 be active, right? Because then it's like, cool. So I think there's natural heterogeneity in the system. I'm not yet, I would love ways to be able to sort macrophages that are live that have engaged damage or not, and really definitively test that hypothesis. I have some ideas on how maybe we could do that experiment. But yeah, I think that TB, the just the natural kind of evolution of the host pathogen interface during infection, I think is naturally creating heterogeneity in the potential for a presentation. And I think that is, that might be enough evasion in and of itself without having to directly disrupt particular responses. Um, the next question is from Rod Rahimi. Great talk. Are there differences in the ability of macrophages versus conventional DC1s in cross-presenting uh, TB epitopes on MHC class one or activating CD8 T cells? Okay, I love that question. Thank you so much for it. Okay, so this is actually what I'm very curious about because CDC1s via danger one or CLEC 9A, can naturally drive a host programmed phagosomal damage program. And so I'm very, very, very curious about what's gonna happen when we either feed uh, CDC1's dead TB infected macrophages or TB directly from the ESX1 mutant. And my hypothesis there is that at least in the presence of danger one engagement, that if with a TB infected, dead TB infected phagocyte, that we should be able, even if it's infected with an ESX1 mutant, the hypothesis I have going in is that phagosomal damage will still be intact. And as long as, and I think the question there is, okay, if, what is the integrity of the TB containing phagosome in the dead macrophage? Because if like TB is still trapped, right, inside of a phagosome, and then now you have the infect, you have the dead phagocyte being taken up into the CDC1. Can the CDC, like, is that only going to damage the phagosomal membrane that like contains the dead phagocyte? And will that be enough to like get the, the, the antigen out of the original phagosome? And I think that's an open question. Like what happened, like I should write that down. Um, because I've never really thought about it that way. Like, what is the state of the phagocyte or the phagosomal membrane after it's been engulfed by the CDC1? Um, but th that that's my that was my zeroth order hypothesis. But now, as I articulated it, I think it raised this question of: Can a CDC1 via danger one damage the phagosome of the phagos of the dead phagocyte it took up with TB? And I don't know that I have an answer to that question. But thank you for that suggestion of an experiment. That's super interesting. Okay, last question uh, from Philip Earn. Uh, for those peptides that you see with uh, TB infection, are they all predicted to encode good CD4 T cell epitopes? And as part two of that, do you think it will be important to have a priming of CD4 or CD8 T cells against the same target? So, okay, really great question. So um, for a number of these antigens, there are also reported CD4 epitopes. Um, in people. So I think that is a, that's a glimmer of hope. 
Um, so that's exciting. I would say that um, the one challenge that we've had, and this is why we need to do the class two experiments as well, is that some of these peptide, some of these proteins just haven't been included in peptide libraries. And so it's an it's a known unknown. Um, as far as your question about priming, um, I I I really think that. I'm not, sh I really don't know if a single dose of a TB vaccine is going to be sufficient. I mean, people have done BCG revaccination and that appears to have a signal. So I think that we are gonna need a prime and a boost. Um, how that occurs and what order and what are the antigens and whether they're overlapping and um, I think is an open question. I don't have an answer for you there yet, but I definitely think my 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 bet is a prime and boost strategy, um, and I just don't know yet what the exact architecture of that vaccine paradigm will look like. That's great. Thank you so much for the seminar and the the questions and um, for a really great year. Um, thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks.